So my name is Edith Lash, and we have a very few minutes to discuss a very big question, diminishing the digital divide. So we all know, or at least we think we know, what this is. We've got about half the world on computers. That means the other half isn't or does not have access to the internet with a smartphone. That's only part of it. And for those of us who have some access, how reliable is it? How expensive is it? How accessible is it? We all learned during the pandemic uh, that for the global economy to function in times of crisis, it's so vital for workers to have access to high-speed internet. And while the developed world pivoted pretty easily to remote work, many in the rest of the world were left behind. So our panelists are facing these questions every day. And I would first like them to introduce themselves to you in a few sentences. Tell me why diminishing the digital divide is so critical in your work. Sophia. Thank you, Eddie. My name is Sophia Swire. I'm the founder of Gender Equity Diversity Investments, a VC firm that's been set up to bring women across the digital divide and into the mainstream as far as investment is concerned. I've also spent 30 plus years in places like Afghanistan and Pakistan um, in the enabling women to have access to education, literacy and jobs. So obviously now we live in a digital world. We need to include women. You also haven't slept very much, I think, in the last few months or the last year or so with what's going on in Afghanistan, right? That's very, very true. And I'm looking forward to becoming an avatar so that <laughs> I can distribute myself across the world virtually from now on. All right, Anna Greta. Hi, my name is Anna Greta Zakna. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Timbatur. Uh, Timbatur is digitalizing the forestry sector, making it more sustainable, transparent, and efficient. And of course, uh, forestry tends to be uh, quite conservative. Uh, therefore, this digital transformation is just only in the beginning. But to become really sustainable, I think um, we need technology, we need data to make uh, wise decisions. And as we are having uh, all ladies panel, I just need to mention the Fantastic. fun fact that um, actually our company was starting off uh, from the hackathon was, uh, that was specially dedicated for female participants. And I was working for the largest uh, software development company and I was just invited to be part. I never knew anything about the timber <laughs> and I was really amazed that this kind of problem existed. And of course I decided to fix it. So here I am. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. There's a mic over there. So, Ala, introduce yourself. Why is the digital divide so important to you? Uh, I'm Ala Abdel Al. I'm the VP of Strategy and Governance at the Digital Cooperation Organization. So, we are an international organization and we represent almost above uh, half a billion of population and a total of two trillion of GDP. So, why it's important for our organization to diminish the digital divide? Because we are the only organization focusing on digital economy. And digital economy is, is the next economy for, for the, it will be the 70% of the economy in the next decade. Mm. So if we do not look how and we solve those challenges and bridge the digital divide, it will really push whoever who are not enabled, who do not have accessibility, more further in this mm. accelerated technology movement. So this is why it's very important for us. Thank you. Sophie. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sophie Smith. I'm the founder and CEO of Nabta Health. We are a hybrid and holistic healthcare provider for women in the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia. We're headquartered in the UAE. Um, we have the slightly dubious uh, privilege of being the first women's health technology company in the Arab world. We're still one of very few health tech companies that has research and development here, um, specifically focused on chronic disease management in women. And why I think um, diminishing the digital divide is important is it's less about the challenges posed today and more the opportunities that we have now. Uh, the next billion people are coming out of Africa. The population of the Middle East, of Africa and South Asia is incredibly youthful. Um, there is a huge need and a desire to build new things and to become globally competitive. Um, here in the region and so the more we can do to digitally enable 
um, companies and individuals in this part of the world, the more we will be able to build globally competitive companies here. Thank you. All right, well, let's, this is one of those challenges that calls for both local and global solutions. We've got folks involved in all sides of that. Tell us, first of all, um, Sophia, um, about the initiatives that, that actually can address diminishing the digital divide that you're working on. So um, I also run an NGO called Future Brilliance, which has been operational in Afghanistan since 2012, 2013. We run the first ever digital literacy training initiative for women. And um, we've created, especially uh, sort of relevant to Afghanistan, dustproof, solar powered, SIM card enabled tablet computers that we preloaded with, with various spreadsheets and so on. And we, we distributed them to our trainees and um, we had 70 women who were able to monetize social media and blogging. We helped female artisans set up websites. At the time it was Skype, not WhatsApp. And uh, we enabled them to, to establish e-commerce sites and, and sell their artisanal product uh, both nationally and internationally. So um, that was very, uh, very early on. Um, now, of course, with the evacuation that you mentioned, um, we've, we've been involved in that as well and so we have had hundreds of Afghan asylum seekers in transit with no ability to earn money. So again, we've been running an ICT digital literacy training initiative at our safe houses in Pakistan and equipping them with um, digital skills that will enable them to qualify as skilled immigrants to countries like Australia that have a skills shortage because nobody wants Afghan asylum seekers anymore. Tragically, the world has opened its arms to Ukraine, but not to Afghans. So from on the nonprofit side, um, you know, I'm a huge and passionate believer in um, giving people across the, not only the digital divide, but across the poverty divide, access to the global economy so that they can become self-sufficient. How successful has it been? It's been, it's been very successful. It, initially, when we distributed the tablet computers, the first thing that some of the illiterate women did was flip them. So they, they made some money out of it. They turned it to cash, right. which I congratulated them for <laughs> because it showed they had good trading skills. Um, but I did explain to them that they needed to hold on to them if they wanted to have a sustainable livelihood. And so now um, we're giving them um, actually proper laptop computers. They've received um, certified, internationally certified uh, uh, training certificates and they're, they're starting to trade out of Pakistan of course, refugees, asylum seekers are not allowed to work anywhere, but mm. there's nothing to stop anybody from working online. Mm. So we're teaming up with the likes of Salesforce and so on, and we're going to be creating a funnel, and, and eventually the, the, the best of the best will be offered very high paying jobs, regardless of whether they're pushed, God forbid, back to Afghanistan or end up in Brazil, Portugal, wherever, they'll be able to have an, a sustainable income. Mm. So from that perspective, I would say it's the most successful thing we've ever done, and I'm amazed that everyone isn't doing it. I think we, we need to plan ahead. You talk about, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's not just um, Africa and, and the Middle East and so on and enabling individuals to become a part of the economy. But within 10 years, we'll have 1.6 billion climate refugees hmm. moving from A to B. And so I hope that we should, you know, we should all start planning um, ahead and, and provide a virtual world in which these individuals can learn and also work. Interesting. Um, I... You know, I laid out a few challenges and you've come up with even more challenges. Before we hear on some of the more local solutions, actually, Ala, why don't you take us through some of the challenges that you see from your, 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 your vista at the DCO? How does what Sophia said chime with what you see in other countries? So uh, amazing, I would like to comment on what exactly Sophia said because she pointed something very important. It's not only about accessibility, but also affordability. So mm -hmm. for them to have the devices to access is another challenge that we need to address. Different countries are accelerating in different paces. Mm -hmm. So we need when we think about uh, the, the ch to equalize the digital divide and bridge it, we have to think of everything, all the elements that are contributing to it. One of them, as you said, we have a 2.9 billion people who are not connected. So accessibility is an issue. Mm. Internet access is an issue. It's a luxury for many till, still. And imagine we have 1.3 billion children who cannot have access to internet. Imagine mm. 
What if they do? How it will impact their education? So this is another challenge, mm. which takes us to the education challenge. So there is also still a gap in the digital skills that will help uh, mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in, in um, uh, developing and will help in each country how they can move forward. So all of this together, as an organization, what we are doing, we are bringing in the governments, the private sector, academia, all of them together to collaborate, mm. to work together to overcome those challenges. Interesting. All right, we'll hear more about the DCO in a minute. Um, Sophie, let's hear your view on how local solutions can help address the digital divide. Okay, so I'll talk to the tech startup ecosystem, mm -hmm. given that it's the one I've existed in for the past six years. Um, so something really interesting happened here, maybe about 18 months ago, or around the middle of the pandemic. Um, dial back five years, the tech ecosystem here was very much an ecosystem. So we saw companies growing up that were like-for-like -like replicas of things that existed in other parts of the world. People wanted to grow them, scale them up to a point and then exit, usually mm. through an acquisition after three to five years. And then, and then the pandemic hit and people realized, I think, that actually supply chains are not guaranteed. Um, local population and domestic security is important. Um, and they started to build things that were really new and locally relevant to mm. support local supply chains, to support local ecosystems. And now what's happening is there is a shift in mentality within the ecosystem to take these companies and to grow them into globally competitive companies. Mm. Um, and so I think there are a few things companies that are set up here in the GCC can do. Firstly, they can create a kind of roadmap for expansion that focuses on the region first. What a lot of companies traditionally have done is they've, they've established themselves in the UAE or in Saudi, and then the next market they look at is the US or maybe Europe. But why not scale across MENA mm. into Africa, into Asia, into Southeast Asia, you know, where GDP is growing at a significant rate. Mm. There are massive populations who need locally grown innovation. The second thing that they can do is employ locals, um, which is really, really important because uh, again, I think in the, in the tech ecosystem, something that is often overlooked as a significant value add is, is employment. Mm. When you employ a person, you create stability not just for them, but for their household and the community yeah. and eventually the country. And so rather than have all of your software development outsourced to teams in East Euro Eastern Europe, for example, you can be employing teams in in the country mm. or in another part of the MENA region or in Africa so that the jobs you create start to have a, a, a beneficial ripple effect through the local ecosystem. Mm, fascinating. So Anna Greta, let's come back to you. You know, Sophia mentioned at the beginning that she looked, wanted to have an avatar. I, I imagine Estonia is a place where you're born. I know you get a digital identity when you're born. I imagine you're also issued with an avatar, is that right? Not quite. <laughs> Well, um, uh, almost. We have our, um, how to say, uh, digital embassy uh, up in the cloud, and mm -hmm. that was already done uh, years ago. And of course, looking at the current situation, the war in Ukraine, it is clear that uh, these kind of threats uh, or these kind of things can be happening as well in Estonia. So we are ready to instantly, let's say, yeah physically move uh, without uh, harming any of the operations. And I think uh, COVID proved the point really well that uh, nobody can ask uh, if we are going to digitalize, but it's rather how and how quickly. And yeah. uh, in Estonia, everything was very, very smooth. I must say that nothing uh, was interrupted. All the public services were provided in the same way as uh, they did. Uh, before, because you know everything, we have more than three thousand services uh, available online, and you have to consider the bigger impact here as well. That uh, uh, you have less uh, CO2 because you don't need to visit any governmental offices. Um, you have uh, much uh, less uh, time spent in uh, traffic jams. You actually spend much uh, less time uh, going from one place to another. We have calculated that. Roughly, thanks to the digital signature, we save three million working hours per year, hmm. which you Amazing, can then it? spend on the family or going uh, jogging, for example. Hmm. So when it comes to digitalization, I think uh, uh, it really uh, results in more democratic 
a more transparent and more inclusive society. Mm. But of course, uh, to get the things done, it's never the question about the technology. It's always a question about the mindset and the political will. So mm. this is where everything starts from. That's interesting. I want you to talk a little bit about what you're doing um, because your work helps not just Estonia, but places like Brazil manage um, illegal logging, for example. And I'd love you to talk about how the local communities are effective and brought in to be part of the solution. Yeah, what we see is actually this uh, digital solution, what we are providing is uh, helping the small farmers or the small private forest owners to get the best price uh, for their material and also value the resources uh, higher. So just one example, uh, one of the, the small forest owners in Brazil realized that thanks to our solution that he can actually sell his timber into the furniture producer not to the uh, uh, not as a fuel wood and get the better price so these kind of examples we hear uh, all the time and I think really if uh, talking about the Brazil uh, technology is the way forward uh, there needs to be much more control and there needs to be much more digitized, digitalized operations. And I have my fingers crossed uh, <laughs> that there will be also the political will mm. to start changing the things soon. Interesting. Well, let's, with that, let's go to Allah because political will can come from governments getting involved. You mentioned you're involved with governments, with institutions, universities, uh, private sector, getting them to collaborate. What is the DCO particularly interested in doing? Give some examples of some of the initiatives you're involved yes. in. Yes, so I was going to say that exactly. So we are bringing the government and private sector to all sit together. So one of the main initiatives, and it also addressed one of the challenges, is investment. The, to really um, uh, bridge the digital divide, we have to have a very strong infrastructure or digital, which need investment and fu funding. And uh, we are helping countries uh, in our uh, recent initiative that we have announced during the World Economic Forum, with them as a partner to attract foreign direct investment to countries, mm. which will help them really invest in the development of their infrastructure. And what kind of things you, do you mean? Just be specific about what you mean by the infrastructure. Uh, and for any di uh, digital infrastructure, so data is an infrastructure mm. as part of the infrastructure. So when we look at what is the fuel of digital economy is data. So uh, cross-border data flow is one of the more main initiative that we have launched when we have started because we really realize that how important it is to focus on how data is treated or invested in locally and also internationally and how it can how we can facilitate that cross-border data flow which will enable also to have a more expansion for the countries so this mm. is this is one thing another thing that we are invested in we have announced is the startup passport which is we are enabling startup to expand very uh, easily from one country to another and smoothly, which also will help in the investment, will help in the uh, development of those startups. Another thing that we are also focusing on, and we think that it's very important, since we have the government, we have the private sector, is knowledge sharing. Because already we, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You don't want to duplicate efforts. So if, if a country is doing something very well in their digital transformation, why not share it with another country mm. so they can start there they can learn from their mistakes so we are emphasizing on all the success stories in our member states we are uh, sharing the knowledge between them and helping them and one main thing is that for us to really bridge the gap in the digital divide we have to understand what are all the challenges and the components and for us dco we have done throughout this year several of round tables uh, around the world in different mm -hmm. regions to understand what is there, what are the challenges they are having to have a better growth in their digital economy and how can such an organization like uh, DCO can help uh, in bridging that divide and gap. Interesting, so, thank you. We'll come back to you in a moment. Sophia, what do you do as an investor? What can an investor do in order to have impact in addressing the digital divide? Well, you can become a gender lens investor, which means you can choose to invest in the top female entrepreneurs. And that's what I am. Since 2014, I've invested exclusively in female-led businesses, 
not as a philanthropic gesture, but because I've come to understand that female investors, when, once they are invested in, outperform, sorry, female founders mm. outperform male founders. Um, and I've actually invested in three companies that are here at FII. One is Sophie. I'm an angel investor in Sophie's business, Nabta. Um, and there are a couple of other amazing female founders here. Uh, Barbara Belvisi, who was um, on, the, on the panel earlier, and another woman, Jane Moss Baker Morris, who's got a value chain transparency platform. All of these businesses have the opportunity to become unicorns, to become billion dollar businesses. And yet in spite of that, female led businesses are very often undervalued, very often overlooked, and, and usually underfunded. 98% of venture capital and private equity funding goes to male founders. Mm. Only less than 2% of funding goes to women. And yet, in this country alone, 60% of new startups are founded by women. Over 50% of university graduates in Saudi Arabia now are females, and the fastest growing rate of, on female on of entrepreneurship in the world, female entrepreneurship, is here. So I think in the West we have many preconceived ideas about what's happening in Saudi Arabia, that women are suddenly being allowed to drive. The fact is, they've they've been in charge for a very long time. It's just we haven't we've only we're only waking up to it now. Mm. Um, so there's huge opportunity here in Saudi Arabia. There's enormous opportunity in the GCC. Sophie's company is I think a Dubai-based company. Um, there's also uh, and some amazing uh, female entrepreneurs in Jordan, and Syria, Egypt. Um, throughout the region. So JEDI, Gender Equity Diversity Investments, we're planning to identify some of those female founders and get behind them with uh, a checks. Uh, and we will also help them grow regionally. I think what Sophie said was very interesting. You don't just have to target the West. I think the balance of power shifted right over mm. to the Middle East and the Far East. And a lot can be done regionally. Thank you. Well, Sophie, take us to the kind of nitty gritty of when you're getting women, particularly to use your, um, is it an app, is that what you call it? Or to use the, the program, what, what, is it, what makes them want to, to pick it up and use it? What makes them want to get involved and use it um, to, in order to manage a chronic health condition? So it's a really interesting business um, because the problem with a lot of people, not just women, is that they don't necessarily identify symptoms as symptoms, mm. especially if they are primary caregivers in their household. You know, you might put down the, the fact that you're tired all the time to the fact that you're, you're chasing two small kids around the house. Maybe you're having to sit repeatedly and you don't recognize that that's a problem. Again, you just put it down to being tired. Um, and a lot of the artificial intelligence that is developed in health tech today, it focuses kind of on the symptom checking and management stage. What we've done with our, with our company, it's a healthcare company, so we have both digital care in the form of SMS-based interactions, we okay. have a mobile app, but we also have clinics, okay. um, is, is we've taken it pre-symptom to the goal because it doesn't matter where a woman comes from or how much education she has or how much access she has, she might not be able to tell you, I'm, I have this symptom and this symptom and I acknowledge them as symptoms, but she'll be able to tell you what she's struggling with mm. from a health perspective. I, I need more energy. Mm. I can't fall pregnant. Um, I keep losing babies. I'm depressed after giving birth. Mm. Um, she can tell you what that problem is and the artificial intelligence that we've developed sits at that layer and so can map common chronic diseases mm. to women who have specific health goals as opposed to starting at the symptom layer. So the women who work with us are women who have problems, health problems, health goals that they want support with. And just tell me what would happen if they were able to manage their, their chronic health conditions. Because we talk about this idea of crossing the digital divide, you know, and it sounds like a great idea, but the amazing thing is once you help somebody do that, you affect all different parts of their life, right? So tell me in, in the bigger picture, what would that mean? They could fall pregnant, what else could happen? So there are a few different things. I think women are key household influencers. That's universally acknowledged. Um, still responsible for the majority of caregiving, also for the majority of consumption-related decisions, about 80% mm. in every industry globally. 
And so if you have a, a woman who is educated about how to effectively manage her health from a dietary and a lifestyle perspective, these are learnings that she will share mm. and pass on not only to her children, mm. but to her husband, to her parents, and to any other dependents that she has. I mean, if you talk about chronic disease in general, uh, there's a lot of research been done now that shows in terms of the human population survival, chronic diseases are as critical as the climate crisis. Interesting. Um, in the West, male fertility is tending to zero by 2045 due to the um, prevalence of chronic disease, which means that in the West, our children's generation will almost completely struggle to start mm. families. It's actually happening faster here because the uptake of sedentary lifestyles, of fast food, of screen-based entertainment is that much more rapid, mm. that same decline in couples' fertility is, is happening faster. So 97% of couples, due to the prevalence of chronic disease, will be unable or will struggle to conceive in emerging markets by 2032. Right. And that's not our children, that's right. us. Right, so, interesting. So chronic disease management is really critical, not just for women and their immediate circle of influence, yeah. but for society at large as well. Interesting. Anna Grata. Yeah, I just wanted to compliment with the example of Estonia and why I think this digital transformation, especially in the medicine, uh, is important. So just to bring in, uh, you an example, so I had two years ago my last baby and uh, <clears throat> with the first baby it used to be uh, so that I had to visit the different uh, offices uh, to get the insurance, um, to get the medical card, etc, etc. But now I got this uh, identity code uh, from the uh, hospital. I only needed to decide uh, the name with my husband. We both signed the name and then I got the email that congratulations on having a baby. You are entitled to this and this this support. So you can choose uh, who is staying at home uh, with the baby. So I didn't need to go to anywhere. So all these proactive services were coming to me and mm -hmm. soon I had the call from the uh, doctor saying, okay, when you will come to visit mm. us so we could see the uh, baby. And just uh, another example, so when it comes to democratic society, so elections are definitely very important. And here we see as well that uh, e-elections are very often uh, used mainly by women because, you know, they struggle to get to their voting office, so they <laughs> rather would do everything online. So It's incredible. You can vote and then actually you can change your vote up until... The, time. the last voting day, exactly, and I think this is again something that, in a way, helps to uh, to uh, increase the uh, inclusiveness and also mm. uh, work in that regard when the country has a lot of uh, refugees or people working abroad mm. that they can also be part of the election process. Interesting. I wonder. Yeah, come on in, Allah. Yeah, I was going to say such examples and such. Uh, development in, in, in countries can be yani, easily easily shared and we wish to have the same success story in each and every country in the world with the same uh, amount of digitalism uh, and digital transformation in the government it would mm. be really amazing to see and apply such uh, stories to every and each country at least in our member states and globally then after you that. mentioned the round tables anything you've learned from those round tables that is interesting to share I was delighted to come to the one in New York and there were fantastic examples, but what have you learned? Yes, so it also, it's again, it shows that everyone recognized that there is a gap and that yes, government and private sector should work together because mm. government alone, if they do not listen to private sector and then there come, come the policies, come the, uh, all the regulations that come from the government without listening to the private sector, it will hinder their progress. Mm. So this is why it's important. This is something that we have learned from our round table. Putting all the, all the people on the table in the same room, mm. having them uh, listen to each other, really accelerate uh, the, the progress that we want, uh, that mm. we want to achieve and even mm. make us achieve those goals in a very fast and, and efficient way. Interesting. So, so Sophia, I wonder if this is a, you know, you've been involved in development on the ground for such a long time. And I wonder if there's something about this point in time that's 
different from other moments in your um, in your career, living in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, traveling around the region here. Is there something about the fact that there's, we're on a tipping point with the fact that half of the world has uh, a mobile phone in their hand that might give you hope, give us a ray of hope in this time of confusion? I think so, because of course, with digital inclusion comes connectivity, not only to the working world, but also to each other, and mm. to extraordinarily new ways of doing stuff. So. Uh, we called it the Digital Dunkirk, but I was mm -hmm. part of a group of volunteers who pulled out tens of thousands of Afghans in the wake of the absolutely disastrous withdrawal of, mm. of NATO from Afghanistan. And there were these sort of pop-up flash mobs of, of individuals and um, State Department people, spooks and so on, who came out of their, their day jobs and sort of collaborated with complete strangers. Give and us an example. Tell us one of the stories. You have some incredible stories. Well, okay. So, so one example is, thanks to the internet, um, I posted on my birthday last year uh, our GoFundMe for, for Future Brilliance. And I happened to use the photograph of Sharbat Gula, the famous green-eyed Afghan girl. Do you remember her, who was on the cover of National Geographic? Photograph taken by Steve McCurry, an extraordinary photographer. Mm. Anyway, so, so that woman, that image, tra uh, changed the course of my life. It was what pulled me into essentially serving Muslim women, Afghan women. And so I put this photograph and I said, there are, there are thousands and thousands of women like this who need our help. And that image had 55,000 hits, that post. In about two hours, that one post had 55,000 hits. And I thought, wow, this image still has enormous power. Mm. But uh, Steve McCurry, the photographer, and his sister got in touch with me because of that post and said, you do realize that this woman still needs to get out. I couldn't believe that she was still there. And she was being, apparently, she was being targeted by ISIS-K as a kidnap uh, sort of candidate. Mm. So uh, because of that, uh, it's a long story, and I we probably don't have time to tell you now, but, but through the internet, through Signal, through WhatsApp, through our incredible team on the ground, um, we were able to pull her out with the help of the Italian Foreign Ministry in the end as well. All of it was coordinated through Signal, through WhatsApp. We got her to um, uh, Islamabad. We interviewed her. I've got a really wobbly footage of her saying thank you to us. Mm -hmm. It's the only footage of her that's been shot in the last few years. Amazing. And uh, she's now living with her family, who we also pulled out, also through WhatsApp and Signal. Um, and uh, they're now all happily living in... Uh, in Rome, and, and we've done that over and over and over again. Even to this day, I've got people in Tehran, I've got people in um, all over the place. We're still negotiating asylum with, with Mexico and um, Brazil, and, and to this day, we're, we're still doing it. And that would not be possible. So, so mm. we, we were a small part of that, but there, there were flash mobs who popped up, who came together in volunteer groups from all over the world. And, and that's the, the, an example of, of how digital, digitization has transformed every aspect of our lives. Fascinating. Thank you. I wonder if you had unlimited resources, Sophie, what would you, what would you do? I'd put a thousand tiny self-sustained and connected clinics. Um, what does that look East like? Uh, a connected clinic meaning? Uh, it, it doesn't look like a like a clinic like you'd see here. It really depends on the place. It could be a, a set of stacked shipping container units that has a walk-in drive-through at the bottom and then rotating factors at the top. It could be a mobile clinic. It could be what we term a clinic in a bag, which is a cold store that sits on a on a kind of local upskilled um, vendor's back. Mm. Um, but I would get I would get uh, healthcare access and connectivity to uh, as many people as possible in emerging markets. Because again, I think if you want to diminish the digital divide and you want to get people innovating and building around the world, you have to take care of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm. Um, you know, the priority report at FII showed that people care about, uh, in, in a developed and emerging markets, um, they care about unemployment, they care about social st stability, um, and then they start to care about other things. When they have the headspace, mm. they know they're safe, they know their families are safe to concentrate on them, so you give people access to good care, you feed them, you get them connected, um, you can start to work on some of the other problems in the world. Thank you, I've just been told time's up, but thank you guys very much. Let's give them a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very, very much. Well done.